Okay, so this kind of marks the last third of this unit. Okay, the first two thirds are the principles of circular motion, uniform, vertical. Okay, and then the last part talks about gravitation and satellite motion. All right, so we're going to do this in the same order it was kind of discovered. Um, so we'll start out with a little history drama because it, this is like one of the like most drama-filled relationships in physics history. Okay, um, so back before Newton came up with his idea for gravitation, people have obviously been observing the stars for a very long time. Okay, they made meticulous recordings of where objects were in the sky on certain days of the year and how they moved in their orbit and things like that. One of the most meticulous was a guy named Tycho Brahe. And Tycho Brahe observed the movement of all of the known planets through his telescope, charted their movements through the sky, and from his observations, believed wholeheartedly that the Earth was the center of the universe and that everything orbited the Earth, which on even detailed observations can be somewhat surmised. Okay? The stuff that's really far away, okay, like other stars and things like that, we can kind of see them wheel overhead during the night. Okay? They don't appear to, to move very much, okay? but the Earth's movement underneath them makes them appear to rise and set. Okay? Same as the, you know, the moon and the sun and all of that. It makes it seem like we're the ones that are stationary and everything else is going around us. Okay? It was a logical conclusion. The problem is, is that Tycho Bray, while excellent at recording and charting and looking through a telescope, wasn't a very strong mathematician. And he had a problem. And the problem was that as he observed the movement of Mars in particular, Okay? but most of the planets, okay? he found that they appeared to pause in the sky, move backwards for a time, and then move forwards again. And he couldn't really explain that observation, but he had recorded it countless times, especially with Mars, given that Mars's uh, orbital period is small enough, it's about two Earth years, okay? um, for him to observe it multiple occasions. It's a little more difficult to observe, you know, Saturn doing that when, you know, in your lifetime you may only observe Saturn completing a complete orbit two, maybe three times. Okay, it's certainly not something you're going to be able to record with Uranus. By the way, that's how you pronounce it. Okay, it is not Uranus. Okay, it's Uranus. Uranus is something else, not a planet. Okay, it's the dark side of the moon or something like that. But yeah, okay. Um, so. It's Uranus, that's how you pronounce it. Neptune hadn't even been discovered, okay? Actually, neither had Uranus at that point. So um, he had only, was only able to observe a few planets and their movements. But Mars in particular gave him a problem because as Mars moved through the sky, it would move normally as though it was orbiting the Earth, and then it would do this. And then it would move normally according to it orbiting the Earth, which is what many people thought at the time. Okay. This is also at the time where Copernicus and, and, the, and, you know, and guys like that were coming up with this idea that maybe not everything did orbit the Earth. Maybe the Earth orbited the Sun, okay, and also that all the other planets in the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. Okay? Um, so there was quite a bit of argument going on around this time. So that little movement gave him pause. He didn't like it because it didn't fit with his ideas. So he hired a young mathematician named Johannes Kepler. And he said, I need you to explain mathematically why an object that orbits the Earth does this. Okay. Kepler being you know, out of work, wasn't a lot of work for mathematicians, was eager for the job. And he began pouring over the copious amounts of paper okay, that Tycho Bray had recorded on the movement of Mars through the sky. He starts doing the math, he starts doing calculations, and very quickly arrives at a conclusion that will get him fired. And that is that Mars doesn't orbit the Earth. <coughs> so eventually, he just goes to Tycho Bray, because Tycho Bray's like, hey, you done the math yet? Hey, hey, can you prove this yet? I need you to prove that you know, Mars orbits the Earth. And finally, he could put it off no longer, and he said, look, 
The only reason that Mars would appear to do this is if both Earth and Mars orbit the Sun. So if Earth is moving in its orbit, and because Earth is closer to the Sun than Mars is, when Earth passes Mars in its orbit, it makes Mars look like it's moving backwards, just like when you pass a car on the highway. Okay? So if you pass a car on the highway and you look to the side, which way does it look like the car is going? Backwards. It's falling behind you because you're moving faster than it is. It's exactly the same thing that causes this to happen. When, when Earth would pass Mars in its orbit, Mars would appear to fall behind the Earth. It wasn't moving backwards, it just fell behind because it was moving slower. Once it got far enough behind again, that relative motion ceased to be evident, and it was like Mars was moving forward again. Okay? And Tycho Bray's like, you're fired. You are so fired. And Kepler's like, but I did what you asked. I did the math. Your data is meticulous. It's awesome. It's the most incredible data anyone's ever recorded but it doesn't say what you want. You're fired anyway! And it gained, became this massive, like, Hatfields and McCoys, like Montagues and Capulets kind of controversy and conflict okay, between these two men. Bray went to his grave, still believing that everything orbited the Earth. Okay? And Kepler destroyed him scientifically. Having done all the math and using all of his data, he proved him wrong in front of the entire scientific community. So you can imagine your life's work being used to prove you are an idiot. Okay? And that you believe in something that is proven to be wrong, but you'll take it to your grave that way. Okay? So these two like butted heads their entire lives. Okay? In the end, it was Kepler that was proven correct. And unfortunately, Tycho Bray's data was the thing to do it. Right? So it was, a, it, was, it was a really big deal at the time. And you can imagine why they wouldn't care much for each other. Okay? It's kind of like that guy that you know, started Netflix because he had to pay late fees at Blockbuster. Okay? Like, yeah, I'll show you, which probably seemed really crazy at the time to the guy at Blockbuster <laughs> who had made him pay his late fee. But yeah, okay? it ended up that that was the way it was. Okay? So, this is what we know, or what Kepler was able to prove with Tycho Bray's data. First, everything orbits the sun. Secondly, orbits aren't perfect circles. All the orbits are slightly elliptical, which means at various points in the orbit, something moves faster than it does at other points in the orbit, because it's not a perfect circle. If an orbit was a perfect circle, the speed of an object actually wouldn't change in its orbit. Everybody follow me there? So, Bray had made these meticulous observations. Okay? Kepler hypothesized that Mars had an elliptical orbit, not a circular one, and until that time, all mathematical predictions of a planet's position in space were based on the assumption that it moved in a circular orbit, and that's why Bray's observations disagreed. Okay? And so, yeah, so began the, the big conflict. All right, so Earth goes around the sun, like so. You've probably seen that, but drawn way better at some point. Okay? When we say an orbit is elliptical, it's not very elliptical. Okay, like we, we imagine sometimes with an, uh, with an elliptical orbit that it actually looks like this. It's so not that. Okay? If Earth's orbit looked like that, we would, we would like consecutively fry and freeze. Fry and freeze. Because that is like way closer to the sun and way further away. We are talking about single digit percentages off of being a perfect circle. Okay? So it's elliptical, but not football. Okay? It's like somebody took a basketball and squished it a little bit. Okay? Kind of like that. All right. So as Earth goes around the, the sun, its orbit is slightly elliptical, which means at some points in, it, in its orbit, it actually is a little bit closer to the sun than others. Okay? What does that cause? Hmm? No, that's actually a totally convection-related thing. It has nothing to do with where we are. The, I, I set people up, and I ask that question, and people go, seasons? But it actually isn't. The seasons are actually opposite what you would think. Winter, we're actually closest. The 
causes the seasons is the tilt of the Earth, right? The, the Earth is actually tilted 23 and a half degrees off of vertical, okay? Which is considerable, right? I mean, it's not like 45, but it's 23 and a half. It, it's a fair <coughs> degree off of vertical. So as Earth goes around the sun, okay, Earth is going to be, well, right now for us, it would look like this, okay? Here and here, Okay, so you'll notice I left the tilt of the Earth the same in all those positions. Okay, when we are at this position, what day of the year is it? December 21st. Yep, this is December 21st. It is the shortest day of the year, the winter solstice. We are pointed away from the sun. So as Earth rotates on its axis like this, we only get into the daylight for a short amount of time, okay? And the sunlight we receive from the sun is very indirect, okay? Because we're tilted away. It has to travel further. It gets spread out more. It's not nearly as intense, okay? As we move around the sun, okay, this would be what day? April 21st? Not April. March. March. First day of spring, okay? This is the vernal equinox. On this particular day, we have 12 hours of sun and 12 hours of darkness. Because Earth, even though it's tilted, faces directly on. And so when it rotates around and around on its axis, it's actually getting the North Pole and the South Pole equally on that day. This would be what day? July 21st? That one. June 21st. This is the summer solstice. This is the longest day of the year. Why? Because the North Pole is now pointed towards the sun. So when the Earth rotates around like this, it barely gets out of the sun. And we get that awesome 19-hour day. Okay? 19 hours of sunlight. It's great. They can fish till 1130. Okay? It's great. Okay. Um, so it spins around like that. And then this would be September 21st. Right? It's the autumnal equinox, or the fall equinox. Again, equal hours of day and night, 12 and 12. All right? We get that okay, because the Earth is tilted, not because the Earth is in an elliptical orbit. As I said, it's actually this point here where we're closest to the sun. Okay? Earth's orbit is weird that way. Okay? Now, according to this idea, we actually had to kind of change the calendar a little bit to, co to kind of compensate for this stuff. Anyone ever wonder why all the months are not the same length? Yeah. Yeah. I've always, like it always bothered me, okay? That like, why is February 28 days? Every other month is either 30 or 31, what the heck, okay? What is going on? Why are all the months different lengths, okay? You've got some months with 31, some months with 30. <coughs> why are all the months different lengths? It accounts for the fact that the Earth moves faster in some of the parts of its orbit than others. Okay? And so, what actually happens is our seasons are not all the same length because of it. Luckily for us, winter is when we're closest to the sun. And according to this formula that we've been working on, if R is smaller, what happens to V? It gets bigger. So we move faster through that part of our orbit, which makes winter, for us, the shortest season. If you look in the southern hemisphere, summer is the shortest season. All the more reason to stay in the north. Okay? So winter is only 89 days. Think of when winter starts. It starts on December 21st. Now, December has 31 days. Okay? How many does January have? 30. How many does February have? 28. That's why. Okay, February has 28 days to compensate for the fact that Earth is moving faster in that part of its orbit and winter has to be the shortest season. Okay, autumn, 90 days. Okay, again, think of when autumn starts. Okay, it starts on September 21st. October has 31 days and, and November has 30. Okay, you go into spring, spring is 93 days, starts in March. Okay, you got a couple of 31-day months through the spring, same with summer. Okay, making sense? So 
summer, and summer is actually our longest season because that's when we're furthest from the sun and are moving the slowest in our orbit. Okay. Strange but true. Okay, so Kepler's first law talks about this law of elliptical orbits. Okay, and that is that as we go around the sun, this, the shape of the Earth's orbit changes and our speed changes as well. Okay, this is highly exaggerated, but this is kind of what it looks like. This would be winter. Okay, this would be summer, okay, and then this would obviously be fall and spring. Okay, so fall and spring, they're pretty much the same. And only slight differences in fall and spring. But we move through a greater portion of the circular part of our orbit through the winter because we're going faster. Okay? Whereas in the summer, we only go through this much of it. Okay? So this is Kepler's law of equal areas. If each one of those sectors represents the same <coughs> amount of time, okay, they still sweep out an equal area of the arc even though they don't represent the same portion of its outer circumference. Okay? Everybody okay with that? That was, that was his mathematical proof for the law of elliptical orbits, because Kepler came up with a few laws. Okay? The law of elliptical orbits, the law of equal areas, okay? and um, the law of periods, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So if we're looking at the eccentricity, to give you an idea here, the eccentricity means how far off of a perfect circle is this orbit. So Mercury is 20 and a half percent off of a perfect circle. So it's quite squished. Okay? So it moves in a fairly elliptical orbit. Not quite a football, but a heavily squished basketball. Okay? Um, now, it's pretty close to the sun, so that's a big reason for it. The sun's tidal forces are constantly doing that to it. Venus, on the other hand, moves in an almost perfect circle less than a percent off of being a perfect circle. Okay? Earth, about 1.7% off of being a perfect circle. Okay? So only slightly elliptical. It doesn't make a huge difference. Okay? Mars, well, it's a bit more. It's a bit more elliptical. And the reason for that is it's got some gravitational influence from Jupiter pulling on it. Okay? And so that means that it's going to have a more elliptical orbit, okay? about 9%. Okay. Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, about 8%. Jupiter, about 4.8. Saturn, about 5.4. Uranus, remember that's how you pronounce it, okay, is 4.7%. Neptune, almost a perfect circle, because okay, there's nothing beyond Neptune pulling on it and messing with it. Okay. Pluto, on the other hand, look at that. 25%. That means at its perigee, which is its closest point, it is 25% closer than an apogee, which is its furthest point. Okay? This is part of the reason why Pluto is no longer considered the ninth planet. It is now considered to be a dwarf planet. Okay? The true definition of a planet is that it must dominate its orbit okay, and move within the plane of the ecliptic. Okay? What I mean by that is, if you look at our solar system, sun here, Eight of the planets can eclipse each other because they orbit in the plane of the ecliptic. Okay, so when one moves between the sun and the others, it eclipses it. Okay. Pluto does not orbit in the ecliptic plane. Pluto does this. It orbits well outside the ecliptic. And it doesn't dominate its orbit. For part of its orbit, it's actually closer than Neptune which means Neptune is the biggest body in its orbital path. Okay? Um, plus, it's got like moons that are almost as big as it and things like that. Weird stuff. Okay? So it's no longer a planet for that reason, and it has a highly elliptical orbit. Okay? Eris, 0.437. Cedna, which is another Kuiper Belt object, 0.857. It's basically a comet. Okay? Comets, when they orbit the, the sun, so here's the sun, a comet will go way out to the Oort cloud, come really close to the sun and then go way back out into the Oort cloud again. Okay? That's <coughs> highly elliptical. So are we orbiting the sun? Like, are we staying stationary or is like the sun moving and we're kind of like following it? Well, the sun is orbiting the galactic center. 
Okay. So we follow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we follow what the sun does. But I mean, we kind of orbit the sun while the sun does its thing and kind of, yeah, pulls us along for the ride. Yeah. Okay, is that making some sense? Okay, so law of elliptical orbits, law of equal areas. Okay, and so this is the difference in speed. At perigee, our closest point to the sun, 109,289 kilometers an hour is how fast the Earth is moving. Okay, at its furthest point, 105,000, it's almost 4,000, actually it's, yeah, just under 4,000 kilometers an hour difference. Okay, so it's a fairly big difference. Okay, enough that winter is only 89 days and summer is 94. Okay, when we're talking about a change of 4,000 kilometers an hour, you don't go as far in your orbit when you're going 4,000 kilometers an hour slower. Okay. Um, all right, so here was, Ke this was Kepler's law of periods, or Kepler's third law. This was the mathematical nail in the coffin for the uh, Terra-centric universe, that means Earth-centered, okay? Uh, and the birth of the heliocentered solar system, that means the sun is at the center of our solar system, okay? Kepler discovered, using Tycho Bray's data, mind you, <coughs> that if he took the period of any planet in the solar system and squared it, and then took the radius of its orbit around the sun, or distance to the sun, and cubed it, and then divided those two numbers, he got the same number. It didn't matter what planet he used. If he did this with Earth's numbers, he got this number. If he did it with Jupiter's numbers, he got the same number. Saturn's numbers, same number. Okay? The only way that that could happen mathematically is if they shared a common orbital center that is the center of the sun. Okay? So basically what he said is, I can set any two bodies that orbit the same central point equal to each other and calculate the orbital period or the orbital radius of either one. Okay? Something which was later part of us calculating where we could spot some of the planets we can't see in the sky with the naked eye. Okay? That would be Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Okay? Those were all discovered by math and then placing a telescope in the spot where they should appear and finding them, okay? Because they can't be observed with the naked eye from Earth. They're too small, too faint, okay? So this formula was part of the calculations that allowed us to determine where a planet should be at a certain point in time and then allow us to point a telescope there and discover it, okay? So Kepler's law of periods is nice because we can use it to calculate things without having to go into huge, complex satellite motion calculations. It does have a drawback, though. You have to know all the information about one of the two things you're using and one of the two pieces about the other one. So in that way, it's a little less useful. Okay? Um, but we can use smaller numbers for it as well. All right, I'm never going to ask you to do any math with Kepler's Law of Periods. It's just there to show you this was the mathematical proof for Kepler's ideas. Okay? All right. So what I would like you guys to do is have his three laws written down in your notes. Okay, so we'll give you a few minutes to get those written down. Okay, so how long is the Earth's orbital period? 365.25 days. That's why we have a leap year every four years. Because okay, Earth's orbit is not exactly 365 days in length. Okay? It's 365.249 something something. Okay? Um, it's 31,556,736 seconds. If you ever wanted some piece of useless trivia, there it is. Okay? Um, and the distance from the center of the Sun to the center of the Earth is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. That is a number we're going to use a lot. Okay? That is Earth's orbital radius. Okay? It is also one astronomical unit, or AU. That you might want to write down. One AU is 1.5 times 10 to the 11, or the distance from the center of the Earth to the center of the Sun. And we use astronomical units as a unit of measurement 
fairly often because it represents smaller numbers. Rather than saying 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters, I can say 1 AU, which is much easier. Okay, so this is the math that Kepler ended up doing. Okay, when he found what's now called Kepler's constant for our solar system, this is the number it ended up being: 2.95 times 10 to the minus 19 seconds squared per meter cubed. Weird units, but that's just what it came out to. Okay, for any planet orbiting the sun, any body actually, it could even be stuff out in the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt or anything that orbits the sun. Now, would the moon have that Kepler constant? What is the moon orbit? Us, Us Earth. Okay, so it has a different, different Kepler constant. In fact, anything that orbits the Earth has the same Kepler constant. Anything that orbits Jupiter, they all have the same Kepler constant, all 60 moons, okay? Things like that. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. All right. Um, there, we talked about astronomical units. Okay, so, this is how we could use Kepler's law of periods were we wanting to actually use them to calculate something. Okay? We could say that if we wanted to calculate the orbital period of Mars, okay, so that would be Mars's orbital period, okay, we could do this. The orbital period of Mars divided by the orbital radius of Mars cubed would equal the orbital period of Earth squared divided by the orbital radius of Earth cubed. Okay, so I know the orbital radius of Mars is 1.52 astronomical units. That means it's one and a half times as far away from the sun as we are. Okay, the only thing I don't know in this equation is the period of Mars orbit. I know the period of Earth's orbit, one year. Okay, and I know the radius of Earth's orbit, one astronomical unit. You see the advantage of having these nice small numbers? So if I want to find the period of Mars orbit, I just move the radius of Mars's orbit cubed over to this side, and then take the square root of this, and I'll figure out how long in years it would take for Mars to orbit the sun. Okay, so the period of Mars would be then one squared, Earth's orbital period, okay, times 1.52 cubed, Earth, or Mars's orbital radius, divided by Earth's orbital radius, cubed. Well, that makes this a pretty easy calculation. I just need to find the square root of 1.52 cubed because everything else in there is a one. Agreed? Okay. So, according to that then, so the square root of 1.52, uh, All right, so one year on Mars is 1.87 Earth years. You may. Okay, so yeah, you only get a birthday a little less than half as often. Or a little more than half as often. Okay, I, again, I'm never going to ask you to use Kepler's law of periods to calculate anything. We'll always use the principles of satellite motion, which I haven't gone over yet. Okay, everybody okay with that? Um, so this actually has a bunch of stuff in it to do with the distances and stuff like that for um, objects in our solar system, okay? Um, just for curiosity's sake, right? right. All right, we were talking about this before, how everything that orbits Jupiter would have the same Kepler constant. So would Mars's two moons. Okay, so Mars has two moons, okay, Phobos and Deimos, okay, because Mars is the god of war, and the companions of war are fear, Phobos, and panic, Deimos, okay, yeah, you laugh. There's a naming system for every planet. If you discover a moon around another planet, you don't get to name it whatever you want. It has to follow the current naming rule, all right, so for Earth, it's easy. The moon. 
Because when you only have one moon, you know exactly what to call it. The moon. There's only one. Okay? But if you're something else and you got more than one, then you gotta have a naming system. So for Mars, it has anything that has to do with war. So if Mars was to pick up another moon or something like that, we would have to name it according to that scheme. Okay? Um, Jupiter, this is gonna sound awful, and it is. The moons of Jupiter are named for the lovers of Zeus. There are 60 some, and we're not out of names. That's the worst part, okay? There are way more than 60 lovers of Zeus. He's not a very nice person, okay? And we use the term lovers very loosely because Zeus was not a nice person, okay? Yeah. Um, for Saturn, all of the uh, moons have to be uh, named for like um, Titans, okay? Any of the Titans. So uh, that's why the biggest one is called Titan and then all the other ones are names of Titans. Uh, for Uranus, it's all the, uh, they're all Shakespearean characters. Okay, so it's like Miranda and Puck and, you know, like all these things from like Midsummer Night's Dream and other Shakespearean plays. And for Neptune, they all have to have some sort of um, sea or nautical type of reference. Okay, so Triton is for the trident that Neptune carries. That's the largest one. Of Neptune, everything else is the name for that. For Pluto, Pluto has a whole bunch of moons actually, okay, all little tiny moonlets, and they are all named for things of the underworld. So Pluto is the god of the underworld, and its largest moon is named Charon, which is the name of the boatman who takes you across the river Styx to the underworld. So, and then everything else is like things to do with the underworld. I don't know who came up with that, but that's, that's the rules. So if you ever discover a moon, you have to follow the rules. So you can still name it, it just has to be on the theme? Right? It has to be on the theme. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can name it whatever you want according to the rules. Okay. Yeah. So not whatever you want. All right. <laughs> okay. So, good. We're done with that. Okay. So now we're going to talk gravitation. Okay. Universal gravitation. So this is credited to Newton. However, Newton never made it work, okay? He came up with the idea, but it required Cavendish to do an experiment to actually make his formula work out, okay? Newton had all the right ideas, but because all of his work was done on Earth and he couldn't remove the Earth's massive gravitational field from his experiments, he was never able to verify the validity of his universal law of gravitation. Okay. It's then since been proven valid, um, but uh, he wasn't able to do it, but he's still credited with it because he came up with the original idea. Okay. So we need to learn the relationship between gravitational attractive force, mass, and distance, and understand that gravity can act as a centripetal force. Okay. Now, at this point, um, if you had Mr. Dickey for Physics 20, he does something that makes everyone feel really uncomfortable. And he makes you look into the eyes of the person next to you and say, I'm attracted to you. <laughs> okay, which is like super awkward, okay? But also true, not in the way that makes you feel awkward, okay? But in the way of you are gravitationally attracted to each other. That gravitational attraction is so small that it produces absolutely nothing in terms of force you can feel but it's there. The problem is Earth's gravitational field is so large that it completely overwhelms anything else, okay? Um, so what we're gonna be looking at is this idea here, okay? That according to Newton's universal law of gravitation, the force of gravity between two objects, not of one on the other, it's always between the two, is equal to big G, times mass one times mass two divided by r squared. Okay, now there's some new things in this formula. First up, big G. Big G is Cavendish's universal gravitational constant. It was the thing missing for Newton, right? It was the thing he couldn't figure out because Earth's gravity kept getting in the way of all of his experiments. Okay. Um, the two m's are the masses that are gravitationally attracted to each other. And r is the separation distance between their centers. 
Okay? And that's really important because when we start talking about big things like planets and stars, they're big enough that their own radii have to be included in the equation. So it's center to center, not surface to surface. Okay? Everyone kind of follow me there? Okay. So here's the thing about Earth. It's round. I think we've covered that. Earth's round. Yes, really. Okay? It's not flat. If you think it's flat, you should probably just drop this class because you're not going to like anything I say for the rest of the class because the flat Earth hypothesis is not real. It's just not going to work. Or it's not a donut. It's not flat. It's not any of those other things. that crazy, some crazy ideas that are out there. Okay? So, Earth's round, but it's not perfectly round. Okay? When Earth formed and it was somewhat molten, it was also spinning really, really fast. Okay? And as a result of that spinning really, really fast, its mass got distributed in a non-spherical way, meaning that at the equator, Earth is wider than it is at the poles. So if you measure the distance from the North Pole to the South Pole, it's smaller than the distance from one side of the Earth to the other across the equator. Okay? So Earth is slightly squished. Okay? And it's slightly squished in such a way that you actually weigh more in places you wouldn't think you'd weigh more than if you were standing at the equator on the beach. Okay, so at sea level. All right, so at sea level, at the equator, a person with a mass of 70 kilograms has a weight of 684.6 newtons. If you go to the North Pole, you weigh more. Why? Your radius is smaller. And the effect of radius here is exponential. Because radius is squared in this formula. So even small changes in radius can result in noticeable changes in the force of gravity, i.e. your weight. Okay? So you actually weigh more at the pole. I said that backwards before, didn't I? I said you weigh more at the pole than you do at the equator. Okay? Because at the equator, you're further from the center of the Earth and have less gravitational attraction to it at that point. Okay? In fact, Earth is so not round that if you are standing at the highest point on the Earth's surface, you still weigh more than if you are standing at the sea level at the equator. That means that on the highest point on Earth, you're closer to its center than if you're twinkling your toes in the sand at the equator. Strange, but true. Okay? That's how not round the Earth is. Okay? It's also how not so big Mount Everest is when you compare it to the actual size of the Earth. Okay? If Earth was a billiard ball, okay, you'd barely be able to feel Mount Everest with your finger. That's how small it is compared to the total size of the Earth. Okay? There are very few things, very few planets in the solar system that are actually like that. Okay? Like, so where you'd actually be able to feel a surface feature if they were miniaturized. Okay? Uh, Mars has actually, like, it looks like it has a hernia. So, um, if, so if Mars was a perfect sphere, okay, it would look like that. But it's got the Tharsis region where Olympus Mons is, this big giant volcano, and the whole planet bulges out at that point. Okay? So it looks like it has a hernia at that point. It also has, on the other side of the planet, a big dip. You know, that big valley? Yeah, that thing, the Marineris Valley. Okay? Uh, it's actually, you'd be, you'd be able to feel that too, because okay? it's super deep. Makes the Grand Canyon look like, you know, a small scratch by comparison. Okay, questions on this idea here. Earth not perfectly round. Still round, still a sphere, and okay? just not perfect. Okay? okay, it's just flatter at some. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So this is what Newton thought of. Okay, Newton realized that objects were attracted to the Earth because everything fell towards it. Okay, uh, but he realized that. It wasn't so much that the Earth pulled things in, it was actually that there was a mutual attractive force between them. This is the whole apple hit me in the head story that's not true. 
okay? It was actually just a, an analogy that he used to explain gravity, okay? The reason I got hit in the head with the apple is because the apple and the earth were moving towards each other. Absolutely correct, actually, okay? We never see it that way because the amount the earth moves is negligible compared to the amount that the tiny little apple would move, okay? Everyone with me on that? Okay, but it's the attractive force between them, okay? That's the same. It's a mutual attractive force between those two objects. Okay? And that's the thing that people always forget when we're talking about something being attracted to the Earth. Okay? It's not that something's attracted to the Earth, it's that they're attracted to each other. We only ever see the movement of the smaller one. Okay? But this is true even for the Earth and the Moon. Okay? We always say, well, the Moon orbits the Earth. They actually, it actually doesn't. They actually orbit each other. Okay? The Moon is big enough that when it orbits the Earth, okay, the Earth actually pivots around and the spot that they both orbit is just slightly below the Earth's surface on the side closest to the Moon. So the Earth actually wobbles back and forth okay, as the Moon goes around it. Okay. They're actually orbiting a common orbital center okay, no, just because their masses are closer. Okay, so this was Newton's idea. Two rocks in space would have um, a mutual attractive force of gravity between them that would be related to their masses and inversely exponentially related to their separation distance. Okay? Whenever he tried to prove that mathematically or experimentally, he couldn't because the Earth's gravitational field always got in his way. So he could never prove this idea. Because every time he did those calculations, he got numbers that were way, way, way too big. Okay. It required Cavendish's experiment to find the universal gravitational constant, big G, which ironically is a tiny number. Okay. But when we're talking about a universal gravitational constant, that's a big deal, so it gets a capital. Also because little g is gravitational acceleration, so it was already used. All right, so big G is actually this number. Times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, and I can never remember the units. It'll be uh, Newton meters squared per kilogram squared, I think, okay, are the units for that. You're never going to need to know the units. <laughs> right there. Okay. Um, that's the universal gravitational constant. You can see it's a very small number, which is what keeps the force of gravity reasonable. Okay, so if you're Newton and you're trying to figure out the gravitational attraction between two objects, how can you do that? So you've got these two objects in your hand. You let them go, what happens? They fall. Stupid gravity. Okay, Earth always gets in the way. Right? If I hang them from the ceiling, they still fall. They still want to go down. They're, not, they're going to be attracted to the earth way more than they're going to be attracted to each other. Even if, I, even if I make them really, really heavy and put them really close together, they're still not going to want to move towards each other because there's a much greater gravitational field that has influence over them. So Cavendish came up with this experiment that removed the earth's gravity from his experiment. He made it perpendicular to the Earth's gravity. So he put these different spheres, okay? So like a big lead ball, okay? He had a really big lead ball and he had these smaller balls, okay? And he put them on this torsion balance. So he had the big lead spheres were stationary. They couldn't move, okay? And then he had the smaller masses moving on a torsion fiber. So here's what a torsion fiber is. It's basically just a little metal wire that was hanging from the ceiling. Okay? It takes a certain amount of newtons of force to twist metal. Okay? It's called your tensile strength or torsional strength or torque ability. Okay? So as the force of gravity pulled on these masses towards the bigger masses, it twisted the wire. Okay? And he also had attached to that wire a mirror and a light source, obviously at that time not a laser. Okay? And so this thing would twist, and he'd be able to measure the degree of twist, which would allow him to figure out how much torque 
was there. Torque is a force, so that was equal to the gravitational force of attraction between the objects, and thus eliminated Earth's vertical gravity. So then he was able to get this gravitational constant. So I'm going to show you, I actually found a video of a guy who replicated. So that's the replication of, of Cavendish's experiment, which then allowed him to know the force of gravity between those two objects. That was the thing that Newton could never get without it being the Earth, right? Like Earth was always the other mass, and it was very difficult to use the mass of the Earth at that time because no one really knew what it was, okay? Um, so he, once Cavendish did this experiment, he knew the force of gravity, he knew the masses, and he knew the radius. So he was able to get from that the uh, gravitational constant, um, which was that 6.67. Now, what we also know about this experiment okay, uh, and about this relationship is that the further away you get, you get exponentially less <coughs> gravitational attraction. So the farther apart two objects are, the less gravitationally attracted to each other they will be. Okay, that sort of makes sense to everybody? Okay, so it's kind of a big deal, and it's exponential. So as two things move further apart, they're exponentially less attracted to each other. Okay, which means that as the moon moves away from the Earth, it is becoming exponentially less and less bound to the Earth gravitationally. Incidentally, if you didn't know that, the moon is moving away from the Earth at about two centimeters per year. Okay. So, you know, in a couple of billion years, if we're not swallowed up by the sun, the moon might go away. I don't know. We'll see. All right. So, let's try this problem here. A yeah, pretty simple problem, but it's using Newton's universal law of gravitation. So, it wants to know what the weight of this melon that the astronauts took to the moon with them was. Okay? So, normally, we calculate weight this way. Why can't I use that weight for this particular question? Yeah. I don't know what little g is on the moon. It's about one-sixth of what it is here, but I don't have a number for that. It's not on my data sheet. Okay? But Newton's universal law of gravitation will allow me to calculate that without knowing it. As long as I know the mass of the moon, the mass of the melon, Maybe we'll start with M, so that didn't work well. Okay. Um, and the radius of the moon, since the melon would be on its surface, I can calculate its weight. Okay, so all I have to do is plug in those numbers. So I'll plug in big G, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, times the mass of the moon, 7.36, times 10 to the 22 kilograms, times the mass of the melon, which was 0.65 kilograms, and then I'm going to divide that by the radius of the moon, 1.74 times 10 to the 6 squared. What do you suppose people forget to do in using this formula most often? Brackets. Brackets. Um, well, actually, no, they don't even really need to put that in brackets. What do they forget to do? <laughs> yeah, they forget to square the, the radius. Like That is the most common mistake. And here's the problem with that. When you get your answer, it should be ridiculously obvious that you have forgotten to square the radius because it will be way too what? Big. Big. Okay. Like, I've often had questions on our unit exam that involve somebody being somewhere on Earth and you're calculating their weight, and people <coughs> tell me numbers that are millions of times too big. And they write that. This thing sitting on Earth, like an apple on the Earth, has a, has a weight of this many million newtons. And I'm like, okay. Right? That's really something we should notice when we get an answer that makes zero sense. So if your answer doesn't make sense, make sure that you double check what you've done, because that's probably the culprit right there. Okay, when we're punching this into our calculator, we got some big numbers. <laughs> All right, so, and we're gonna need some brackets, because everything's gonna need the E's on it. So negative 11, okay, and then uh, 7.36 E22, and 0.65, and then we'll divide that by 1.74 E6 squared. Okay.
So on the moon, that thing has a weight of one newton, approximately, 1.05 newtons. On Earth, it would be about six times heavier. Everybody all right with what I did there? Okay, is that a fairly easy formula to use? Right. And I mean, all you're ever going to be asked to do is calculate either weight, radius, or one of the masses, okay, which is just algebra. <coughs> Okay, now, obviously gravity acts as a centripetal force. We see that all the time. Orbits are all either elliptical, okay, or like s mostly circular, okay? The reason for that is the delicate balance that occurs between the force of gravity and the inertia of the object, okay? Just like it is with any other circular motion. So, if I had, let's say, the Earth and an asteroid, and there was no gravitational attraction between them, the asteroid would obey Newton's first law and keep traveling at a constant velocity in a straight line. Okay? There is obviously gravitational attraction, so the asteroid tries to move according to Newton's first law, but accelerates towards the Earth because of the gravitational attraction between them. But it wants to follow Newton's first law. But it's attracted to the Earth. But it wants to follow Newton's first law, but it's attracted to the Earth. I won't, I won't keep doing that. Okay? But if I keep following that, <laughs> What do I get? Circles. Okay. It is the balance between those two things going on at the same time that produces the circular shape of a proper orbit. Okay. All right. So let's say this is what we're going to be moving towards in terms of satellite motion. Let's say I wanted to calculate how fast the moon moves in its orbit around the Earth. Okay? So the moon moves in a circle around the Earth, yes? And gravity is what's causing that to happen, yes? So does that mean then that gravity is acting as the centripetal force? Okay. So here's the things I know then. I know the mass of the Earth. It's 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. I know the mass of the moon. It's 7.36 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. You will not be expected to memorize those numbers. They are on your formula sheet. Okay? Um, no, actually the mass of the moon isn't. But, um, the radius of the orbit of the moon, which would be the radius of the circle it moves in, One point eight six <coughs> times ten to the eight. What's it say on your formula sheet? It's under other useful constants. Average Earth Moon distance. No, three point eight five. Three point eight five times ten to the eight. Okay. So those are the things I know. Those are also the things I need if I want to calculate the speed of the moon in its orbit around the Earth. So all I'm going to do is go Fg equals Fc, and I'm going to go big G times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the moon divided by the radius of the moon's orbit around the Earth squared equals mv squared over r. Right? Gravity is acting as the centripetal force here, so that's the reason orbits happen, yes? What mass do I use on the right side of that equation? If I told you you had a rock and you were whirling it around and around in a circle, what would you want to know about the rock? It's mass. Which mass should I use on that side? The moon, because it's the one that's moving in the circle. What does that mean is going to happen to the mass of the moon? It's going to cancel because it's on both sides. Okay. Now, here's what that tells you. It doesn't matter what's out there at that distance from the Earth. The orbital velocity is independent of its mass. I could put a basketball, a dump truck, or a moon out there, and it would need to move at the same speed to maintain that orbit. Its mass wouldn't matter. 
Okay. So when I manipulate this for V, I'm going to bring R over here. Okay. The mass of the moon is going to cancel. This R is gone. Okay. And then I'm going to square root. Now what happens to this R and this R squared? Right, they're going to cancel. All right, so what I'm going to be left with is that V equals the square root of big G times the mass of the Earth over R. Okay, so when I'm plugging in my numbers, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24, that's the mass of the Earth, divided by 3.85 times 10 to the 8. So, bracket, bracket, bracket. when they shot Artemis 1 towards the moon. They didn't aim for the moon. If they did, they'd have missed it by a long way. Okay? Because you'd be pointing at the spot it was when you launched. By the time you got out there, at you know, one kilometer per second, it would have gone a long way. Okay? So they don't actually aim for the moon. They aim for where the moon will be when Artemis gets there. Okay? All right. Is this making some sense? Okay. It's really not a lot different than what we were doing in the earlier part of the unit, right? Anything can act as a centripetal force. When we're talking about orbits, the centripetal force is Newton's universal law of gravitation. Still the force of gravity. So, like, does the International Space Station, like, orbit around Earth? Yep. Oh. Yeah. And it's in very low Earth orbit, so it only takes around 88 minutes or something like that for it to go around one time. So they get like 18 sunrises and 18 sunsets a day on the International Space Station because they go zipping around. I mean, if you've ever seen it at night, you can actually sometimes see it moving through the night sky and it just like zips across. Yeah. Okay, so gravitation is a big part of space exploration. Okay? If we want to get somewhere, um, we often use gravity to help us get there. We have to work against it, obviously, to get off of Earth. Okay? But after that, we can use it and harness it to go elsewhere. It's what's called a gravity slingshot. Okay? You've probably heard about that if you've seen The Martian. Okay? It's the, the course they use when they're having the, the secret meeting. Okay? And, and uh, what's his name tells them about this course that he's figured out that would be a gravity slingshot around the Earth and back to Mars again. Okay? We use the gravity slingshot all the time because it's free. Okay. We get an acceleration or a change in velocity for very little expenditure of propellant. Okay. Way less than it would require us to do if we just wanted to use propellant to go faster. Okay. So what you see on this diagram here is actually all of the space flight that has occurred from Earth up to about 2014. Okay. So there's a few missing from there that are more recent. So if we're following the paths here, obviously they all depart from Earth, okay? the most visited thing is the moon. Okay? And we go generally directly to the moon. We don't use a gravity slingshot from somewhere to get to the moon, because okay? that would be inefficient. So we go directly there. But if we're going elsewhere, okay, like even to, well, to Mars, to Venus, we generally don't use a gravity slingshot to get to them because they're close enough. Okay? But if we're going to the outer planets, we do. Okay? We'll use Jupiter most often as a gravity slingshot. Sometimes we'll even use Venus as a gra gravity slingshot to shoot us further out into the solar system, as you can see with these two green lines here, okay? that represent Cassini and Galileo's paths. So they went to Venus first and then went to Jupiter after that. So they used the sun's gravity 
and then Venus's gravity to slingshot them back out the other way. Okay, so you can see most of the missions that we've sent to the outer solar system have gone around Jupiter, then used Saturn, etc. Okay, um, on their way out because the gravity slingshot works. Okay, it's just something that gives us that extra energy. Now, weird thing about this diagram. Notice all the different colors? Okay. So the darker lines are failures. The bright lines are successes. Are there a lot of dark lines? Yeah, we're bad at this. Yeah, we're, we are. It's not that we're bad at it. It's just that space travel is hazardous. Okay? Like, it is tough to make things work when you're sending things over those kinds of distances. Okay? Um, like around Venus, for example, um, NASA hasn't done a whole lot of exploration around Venus. Um, the Soviet Union and Russia did a lot of it. And you can see that very early on, there's a lot of dark. Okay? Not a lot of successes um, early on because they were actually trying to land on the surface of Venus okay, very early on. What they didn't know was that Venus's atmosphere is so thick that the pressure from its atmosphere on the surface is higher than at the deepest place in the ocean on Earth. Okay? So we, we can't make submarines that can go to the deepest parts of the Earth or to the ocean on Earth and not be crushed. Okay? So they had to develop a spacecraft that could not only withstand the fact that it's going to be hotter than your oven on the self-cleaning cycle, but it's also not just trying to bake you, but trying to crush you. So the first few probes that they sent to Venus would go partway through the atmosphere and then just quit because they'd actually get crushed like a pop can. Okay? So they eventually got them to land on the surface. It was actually a bit comical because you know a bunch of people ended up in a salt mine in Siberia for their failures okay, um, in this program. So the first one that successfully landed, so it lands on the surface, it basically just looks like a, like a K. It's about that big, okay? It's about that same shape. Um, and it's got a lens, it's got the camera with an obviously, obviously with a lens cover, and it's got a sampling arm just below the camera. So it lands successfully. They pop the lens cap off remotely to take pictures of the surface, and then they use the sampling arm to take a sample of the surface. What do you suppose they sample? The lens cap. Because that's what happens when you put the lens right over top of the sampling arm. When you eject the lens cap, it lands right where the sampling arm will go down. You know somebody ended up in a salt mine with that one. Okay. Um, so the next time they offset them by like a couple of degrees and then it was a little easier. Um, so yeah, they eventually got them and they survived on the surface for I think the last one was like a couple of hours. Okay. And they got some cool pictures there. Okay. Even Mars, not easy. About half of the missions to Mars were failures. And that's because landing on Mars has the opposite challenge to Venus. Venus's atmosphere is super thick, so it's easy to slow something down. Mars' atmosphere is 1 100th. It's actually the inverse. Venus, 100 times thicker than Earth. Mars, 100 times less thick than Earth. Okay? So it's, um, you can't slow down very well. So lots of things just became craters on Mars because we couldn't slow them down uh, quickly enough. Um, the other challenge on any place landing somewhere else is that it has to be done by computer. Okay? We cannot remotely pilot something to the ground. Yeah, it's the speed of light limitation. Okay? The forward and back time, even if Earth and Mars are really close together, is still almost 10 minutes. Okay? So you could never, you, you put in an input and 10 minutes later it happens, right? Okay. Uh, you'll have a quiz tomorrow, guys. I'll post it at the end of the day.